So uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Andy uh, from LeadIn. Thank you. So they say, save the best to last. Um, thank you for sticking around. Um, it's quite ironic, really, that um, this is the last presentation, because what I'm going to talk to you about is why you should put your users first, and you should always think of your users up front. So also talk about why your customers aren't necessarily your users, and why it's vitally important that you identify exactly who your users are. Now. Over the last couple of days, I've noticed that um, quite a few of the presenters have talked about people and talked about users, which is encouraging. Um, it's less now about technology first, develop technologies, and then hope people will find ways of using it. It's now it's more about think of the users, think of the user need, um, and adapt your processes and your technologies to meet that need, which is good, because that's where we come in. A little bit of background about LeadIn. We're a, a service production company. And what that means is we work with businesses across the globe to help them design or redesign processes, products, systems that meet a user need, that put the users first. Um, and we like to say that we develop systems that empower people to achieve more. It's really it's putting the user at the heart of everything that we do. Originally, we're based in Finland. We've got offices in the UK. Um, I'm based just up the road in sunny Swansea by the bay. Uh, and LeadIn is really populated with lots of PhDs, lots of people with expertise in computer-human interaction, in user experience. Uh, and we also have software engineers who all put the user at the center of everything that they do. So that's a theme um, with us, and that's a theme that will run through it. To demonstrate a little bit about what we do and how we do service production, I'm going to use a hypothetical example. And in this hypothetical example, uh, we have an estate agent. They want to sell houses. They want to develop a system that helps them sell houses. Pretty straightforward. So who's the customer? Well, the customer in this example is, let's call him Martin. Martin's the CEO of the estate agency. He's the customer, he's our customer. He's the one that's gonna commission us to build the system or redesign the system for him. He's gonna pay the bill at the end of the day. But he's not the user, he's probably never gonna use the system. The primary user of the system that he's developing is Holly and her boyfriend. They want to buy a house. They're gonna use the system. They're not gonna have any training on the system. They're gonna use it remotely without any supervision. So it needs to work for them. It needs to be attractive, so they want to use it, and it needs to be easy to use. But clearly, they're not the only users of the system. We've got Tom and his wife. They're selling their house. They want to know that their house is on the system, it's being represented correctly, it's priced correctly. They probably want to send the details to their family and friends. Um, and they also want to know if people are coming around to view their property when they're coming around. So they're a user of the system. There's Steve, our dreaded estate agent. Clearly, he uses the system as well. He manages the process. So he's also a user. He needs to know who, who he's showing around, which house, when, etc. Even before Steve gets involved, there's Joe, our valuer. He takes the property details, forms the, product, the, the property listing. There's Emma and the estate agency team. They manage the listing, they manage the viewings, they make the appointments for Steve, the estate agent. They're users of the system as well. And then eventually, when the, system, when the property gets sold, there's Jess, she's our solicitor, she does all the conveyancing and the paperwork. Again, another user of the system. So it, even with a simple example, it becomes clear that your customer isn't necessarily your user. And you've probably got a lot more users of your system or your products than you really thought of. So then the problem becomes, who do you design for? With all of these users, who do you design for? Well, the answer is all of them. You've got to design for all of your users. The first step 
in this process is to identify exactly who are your customers and who are your users. And if you look on the left-hand side, your customer, as we described Martin in the example, he's the person that's going to pay for the product. He's the person that's commissioned the product. He's done some research, more than likely. He knows who your competitors are. Um, branding is, has an impact on him, but he's not your user. Your users, as we've seen, are, are probably multiple users. They're people who touch your product. There's probably lots of them, as we said, and they've all got specific needs. They will learn to love or hate your product, and they're going to touch your product and talk about it to their friends. If they love your product, they'll become your biggest advocates. But they probably haven't really got much of a voice in the buying process. They might even be forced to use the system. So designing with multiple stakeholders is, is, can be quite a problem. We use a three-stage process in our service production. It's similar to producing a film. So we have a pre-production, a production, and a post-production phase. And we use a system that we call casting to develop personas that keep the users at the center of this process. If you think of a film, a great film has to have a great cast. And a great cast is one that's clearly, ident uh, clearly defined and has identifiable characteristics. So we use a system that we call casting. And how does that work? The first step is, as I said, was, is to identify exactly who are your users and who are your customers. This can take some time, but it's, it's a critical step in the pre-production phase, and it's worth taking time over. And we do that with uh, a researcher. We use a researcher to facilitate a workshop. And this workshop, the purpose of the workshop, is, is to identify everyone involved in the process, all of the users, uh, everybody that's impacted by or takes part in the process. Involved in the workshop is you want to use as many people as possible that are currently involved. So you're using, in our estate agency example, we've got Martin, the CEO, we've got Steve, the estate agent, uh, we've got Emma from the back office staff, but we've also got Holly, the purchaser, and Tom, the vendor. So we use all, all of these people in the workshop to help map out exactly who's involved in this process. Quite often, this, this workshop will identify users that you hadn't first thought of. You might identify um, Sean, the PA, who has to uh, report to Martin and the estate agency board every month how many properties have been listed. So a user that you might not have first thought of. The workshop also maps all of the processes in the system um, against the users and defines use cases and user groups. Some of the, once you've identified the users and the, and the use cases, the next step is to interview as many of these user groups and users as, as is possible. And it's really important to, to do as many of these interviews as is practical actually in the workplace. I'm losing my microphone here, just bear with me. So by doing these um, interviews in the workplace, you can identify, um, you can get much more informed insights. And it helps to identify issues that might not come out in a traditional sense, in traditional interviews. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So we work with a, a large mining company, um, and we were helping them redesign the process for positioning their big drilling rigs, and they use an automated process to position these GPS process, etc. We identified the users and the use cases and started doing interviews in the field. When we talked to the surveyors out in the field, an insight that was developed was that they were using mobile units, tablets, to help them position these rigs. And the colors and the fonts used in the system were actually very difficult to read outdoors in bright daylight. And a lot of their work is outdoors. So that, that's an insight that we might not have gained if had we just given them a questionnaire or done a traditional interview. Another example 
nice big sexy machine. These are electrical drives used in lift equipment. So we, we did the same process. We worked with the company to identify who are the users, who are the customers of the system, and went out and interviewed as many of the users as, is pos as was possible. One of the user groups that we identified were uh, maintenance engineers, and they worked with these drives on alpine ski lifts. So we interviewed them in their workplace, a tough job at the top of the slopes. But when we talked to these guys, we found that if there was a, an error on one of their drives at the top of the ski lift, they needed to physically go out, read the error code from the drive, order the part back to the stores, pick the part up, fix the drive. An insight that had we sat them in an office and given them a questionnaire and done a one-to-one -one interview, might not have come out. So clearly you can put some remote monitoring equipment in that saves them going up, up and down the mountain all the time. So carrying out these interviews in the workplace develops much more powerful insights. So back, back to our estate agent. Once we've done all of these interviews, what we do then is we we synthesize these down into personas. These personas represent the core use, users and use cases in the process. We actually physically create persona cards. So these are, these are A5 cards that everybody in the team has. These cards have details of the user, the use case, uh, their ambitions, their, their frustrations, and we give them pictures and we make up names for them. Everybody in the team has these, and these really bring the personas and the use cases to life. We had one um, project that we worked on. We went through this process, developed our persona cards, presented them to the management team, uh, and the managing director of the company said, I know him, swore blind that he knew the guy in the, in the persona card. You know, we told him it's a synthesis of a user case, use cases and users, and he didn't really exist, but he was, no, no, I know that guy. I've seen him. Typically, we'll have four to, between four and eight persona cards, and it's actually a real positive when somebody in the team thinks they know someone in one of the cards, because that means the researchers have really done their job. They've really uncovered the, the use cases and the user groups. And we, we use these cards throughout the project. In the next phase, the, the software designers, the software engineers, and the user experience um, guys get together and work with these uh, use cases to start to develop concepts. All the while, they're checking the concepts back against the persona cards. They're saying, Steve, the estate agent, how would he cope with that? and they've got their little um, aid memoir to remind them of how he uses the system and uh, what he does with it. Moving on from that, we develop prototypes. Uh, and this is where the magic comes in. The prototypes are developed, and again, at every stage, the, the team working on the prototypes, the test engineers, every time they do any testing, they're using their persona cards, their cast members, they're checking that the process works for each and every member of, of their cast to check that uh, it's meeting the user needs. And this is keeping the users really at the heart of the development process. We have what's called a casting master. He's like the project manager, if you like. And his role is, throughout the project, is to take the the place of one of the, one of the personas, one of the cast, and challenge each of the team to make sure that they've, they've considered Emma in the back office. They've considered Tom, who's selling the house. Does this work for him? How would they cope with this? Bit of a schizophrenic, but he takes on many roles and, and keeps everybody at every stage, keeping the users at the center of the, of the development. And it's... These, these personas actually live on beyond the project. They live throughout the whole process, but what we find is um, it, it can be very re rewarding 
if we go back to a client for a follow-up project maybe months or years later, and they're still in their businesses referring to Steve, the estate agent, or Marcus, the coordinator in this example. They actually, these personas are, are living and breathing in their business, and they're continually helping them focus on their end users. And focusing on end users can be quite difficult. Um, I was in a talk yesterday with the guy from NATS, the air traffic control people. Ultimately, their end user are all of us who fly in planes. They're protecting the airspace. Yet they never talk to their end users because they're dealing with their customers, who are the airlines and the airports. So a project with somebody like that, where we bring their end users to life, really helps them um, consider everybody in their process when they're, they're designing their business. So that's what we do. Um, what I would encourage you to do in your businesses is to go away and think of, take time out and think of exactly who, who are your users, who are your customers. And I, I almost guarantee that you'll think of, somebody will come up that you hadn't first thought of. Once you've written down who all, all your users are, or your potential users, map those against your current business processes. And when you identify gaps, which you undoubtedly will, think of those as positives. They're real opportunities for you to develop your business and meet your customer needs. And who knows, you might come up with some new processes, some, some new products. You, know, you might even sell some houses. But it's well worth time taking, taking time out uh, and mapping out all of your users. If we can help you, we're more than happy to. Uh, and my details are up there. But I'll put it open to questions if anybody's got any questions. Yep. Can you give us a couple of other examples aside, aside from the state agencies? We, we tend to work with a lot of uh, companies that do um, business to business. And so they don't really get to see their end users. So quite often, they'll use us as a proxy, if you like, to go out, to first off, identify who are their customers, who are their users. But then quite often, we'll actually go out into the field and talk to their end users um, who might be at arm's length. So in an example of, of the air traffic control guys, we would go out and talk to passenger groups, etc., and feed that back into the process and develop the persona cards for them so they can continue to use that in their, in their business process. Yeah, so business to business is a bit of a misnomer, really, because that's your customer. But you're actually providing a service quite often or a product that has end users at the end of the day that might be two or three places removed. Um, so for a, for a company that's selling B2B, it's critical that they understand their end users. Um, in the maintenance engineer uh, example, the maintenance engineers aren't the customers. They ne the, the, the company that produced the drives never deal with them. They sell the drives to the, to the customer, and it's gone. Um, the maintenance engineer then has to actually use it every day. And so understanding his feedback goes right back into the R&D process and produces a better product. Yeah. We're currently working on quite a large Product, uh, project in the public sector where the end user is you and I, it's, it's everybody in the UK. Um, and we're working with them, um, with Ian and his team, I don't know if you, you were in the talk earlier with uh, Ian from the DVLA, working with him and his team to help bring users into their processes. Their processes on the whole, their legacy processes are very paper-based, um, very lengthy, uh, very labour-intensive. So Ian's passionate about digitizing that process, um, but w in doing that, not forgetting the people at the end of the day who have to fill those forms in or have to go through those steps online. Um, so quite a challenging project, but a very rewarding project uh, and equally rewarding to see a business suddenly thinking, 
we've got people at the end of the day that we need to deal with, so we, we shouldn't forget them. Yeah, absolutely. So if there's no more questions, I'll just remind you that Digital Tuesday have their first birthday. Um, I think it's downstairs, so if you've got a few minutes, drop in, um, see what's going on. You might learn some more as well. But thanks for listening uh, and have a safe journey home. <laughs>